All right, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome, thank you so much for coming. Hopefully we will uh, resolve our uh, Zoom issues soon, in which case I want to tell you that very likely uh, <laughs> the meeting will be uh, recorded so that folks who aren't with us tonight can watch, um, although the recording will focus right here on the um, speakers. So I'm Rachel Miller, I'm the council person for Ward 13 and very happy to have you here. Um, and I wanted to just do a little bit of, uh, you know, we're here to talk about the Cranston Street Armory the Warming Center. Um, and do a little bit of a history, I think that we all know, but just so we're starting on the same page, right? So uh, back in December, in response to, I'm um, standing, I'm being projected on. Uh, <laughs> back in December, uh, in response to like really overwhelming meat uh, this year. Oh, we're all good at the technical difficulties today. Uh, the state announced that the armory would be used as a warming center. I think we're all aware of that, and I, I think that, um, you know, without a doubt, that effort has uh, saved lives this winter, right? So I, I want to start there. I want to um, recognize some folks who are here to join us and having a conversation, and we'll take us through a few more few more bits. But this meeting, I'm very grateful to our co-hosts, including the WBNA. We've got Caleb and Rod helping um, <laughs> deal with Zoom right now. I thank you for that. We have. Uh, a mic that goes in and out. We have uh, Siobhan, um, uh, excuse me, Siobhan Callahan, Interim Executive Director. We'll hear from Noel Sanchez in a minute. Uh, also, we're being co-hosted with Senator Sam Bell. Senator Sam Bell. Uh, Representative Enrique Sanchez. We have with us uh, tonight Brigadier General Andrew Chevalier from the National Guard, Lieutenant Colonel David Lamont from the National Guard, Eileen Hayes, who we'll hear from shortly, uh, Rhode Island Housing Secretary Stephon Pryor, uh, I believe Representative John Lombardi just walked in. Um, we also have with us the Chief Operating Officer of the City, Courtney Hawkins, thank you for joining us, and the City Chief of Staff, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Director James Thorson from the Department, the State Department of Administration is also here. Um, we have several other members from our city. I want to thank you all so much for joining us. Um, as well as Lieutenant uh, Ferlini from the Providence Police, who's also our district's uh, lieutenant, so might be a familiar face, but it's also a place uh, to ask questions tonight. Um, we have Captain Fernandez here with us. We have Brian Burns, uh, the superintendent, uh, Deputy Superintendent of Parks. So, and as well as all of you, both residents, long-term residents of the neighborhood and guests of Armory. And so our goal tonight is to be able to have a conversation, have questions answered. So as I was saying, right, back in December. One minute and we're going on. No. One minute, we're getting a better mic. <laughs> hey, oh no, we're good, we're good. Thank you, beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, all right. So, um, you know, since then, we've heard from, from residents, we've heard some concerns. You know, myself, uh, Senator Bell, Representative Sanchez have uh, tried to respond. Oh, and we've got Pro Tem uh, from the Council of Amcacharga. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, you know, we've been trying to feel, feel concerns, but really what we wanted to do was to get here together in the room to have questions and answered uh, with uh, Secretary Pryor and other folks in the state who were making decisions about the armory. So um, we had a meeting about, uh, I think actually exactly three weeks ago, to plan tonight's meeting. And I just wanted to give folks a quick refresher on that. So we're all, again, starting from the same place. Um, but really what we, what we discussed uh, in that meeting, I brought my crib sheet. <laughs> um, so the first and foremost, we talked about really needing a point of contact, like a phone number to call when there are issues that arise. Uh, we talked about uh, everyone together making best efforts to phase out the warming center in April of 2023. That is now coming very soon. Uh, we talked about this community meeting, so thank you all for coming. Um, and then, you know, we talked about the city's role in working with the state uh, to continue to uh, find places for people who are unhoused to be, to be safe uh, and warm and sheltered. 
And so that was the basis of the conversation. We're here tonight um, to have that conversation. And I do have a facilitator who will be joining us shortly, and I'm excited to introduce him. Before that, I want to uh, turn it over to Noel Sanchez, who's the treasurer of the um, WBNA, who is over here. Uh, so uh, we'll be here. Uh, we'll hear from a few people tonight. Um, we'll open it up for Q&A, and we're, uh, in respect for everyone's time, going to uh, try and close by 8.30. But first, I want to uh, welcome Noel. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. So I, my name is Noel Sanchez. I'm a neighbor uh, of WBNA uh, on the board for a while. And I just wanted to share or remind what WBNA has presented already regarding this issue, um, that we were supportive of the use of the armory as a warming center, that we also have, um, we would like to see the transition of the warming center and the people who are living there who are using it to be done in a, in a proper way where they're not just put out but also help to find a place to go and the services that they need. And, um, and also, we also have uh, been working a long time about the armory and we would like to see the, you know, the government kind of move along on the plan for redeveloping the armory. I've lived in the neighborhood since 1994. I think I moved in and a little bit after the guard moved out and the building has been unoccupied since then. And there is, a, there is some initiatives and there was a plan that was uh, approved for redevelopment. We would like to know what's going on with that. And that's essentially our, uh, what we've done about the armory recently. And uh, Siobhan is next. Uh, no, thank you. No, yeah. okay, thank you. Unless Siobhan, would you like to say anything? All right, thank okay. you, Siobhan. Um, and yeah, thank you, Noel, so much for bringing that up. Are there uh, members? So that's the other piece, right? Is that the community has been involved for uh, several years now in looking at the long-term future of the Cranston Street Armory. And I see Kari is here. Are there other members of the steering committee who are present? You just raise your hand. I want to thank you all so much. Um, I know that folks have questions about the long-term use. Back in December, we had a community meeting with um, Scout, who is uh, in process and in conversation and I know we'll get to talk a little bit more about that tonight too. So in order for me to be able to participate and hear really from community members who have joined us, uh, I asked someone to help facilitate tonight. And so Mike Stevens, who uh, is the director of community engagement for the province police and a powerhouse community uh, leader in his own right, stepped up. I want to thank Mike so much uh, for joining us and I'm going to turn the mic over um, we'll all get to you know hear the presentation and we'll get to hear uh, have a good conversation tonight so thank you thank you councilwoman good evening everybody how you doing my name is Michael Stevens I'm the community engagement uh, director for the province police department we have a couple of guests gonna be speaking today and I hope that what we can do is let them speak uh, until the end and then we at the end we will have questions and answers uh, for each one of you, hopefully that we can respect each other's time and respect each other here so we can get through this and honestly go and talk about our concerns that we have in our community. So uh, I hope that would be uh, helpful that if everyone could disrespect that. The first one I'd like to bring up, um, she is Eileen Hayes. She's executive director of the Amos House. Thank you to all of the neighbors who actually did welcome us when we moved into the Army back in December 18th at 4 o'clock. I'll remember exactly. Um, we received the contract on December 17th, and we had 30 staff hired ready to go by December 18th. And many of you came by and dropped off donations and asked how you could help. and. Really, it felt um, like an amazing uh, community effort, and we were very grateful and appreciative of that. Um, I know that there's a lot of emotions around the armory, um, and I also know that um, there are conflicting needs. There are the needs of the folks that have been calling it home since December 18th, even though it's not a place that should ever be called home. We have cots, we do not have bathrooms inside, we do not have showers. 
when we took on the contract, we were taking on a contract for 50 pots and possibly 16 overflow. We've had close to 200 people every night, which speaks to the incredible need of our own unhoused folks in the state and in the city. And many of these are actually city residents. So that being said, I recognize and appreciate the burden that it has put on the neighborhood. And I'm here to say that I absolutely know we should not be there long term that we are working towards being done with the armory by the end of April because it's not the place for people to be in the summertime. It's not a long-term solution. It's not a short-term solution, but it's what we were faced with when the need just kept growing and growing and growing. But I want to give you a little bit of context of the folks that we've actually engaged with and helped. We've had Many, many folks dropped off at the armory from area hospitals, discharged to the street in wheelchairs. The first week we were there, we had two men that were in their 80s, one with stage four cancer, who had no place to go. And he slept on a cot with us for about a month until we got him into assisted living. We've placed about 15 men in a, and women in assisted living. We've had probably 15 individuals that have gone from the armory to detox and into Amos House's 90-day treatment program. Two of those men are now reunited with their families and their kids have been reunited and they're living in one of our apartments. So we've had a lot of wins, a lot of really important wins. We have been there since December 18th, and not one person has died of an overdose. Yes. Not one person. <laughs> Just so you understand the context, in 2021, there were 435 overdose deaths in our state. 435. So the fact that we've had close to 200 people a night many struggling with substance use disorders and nobody has died is incredibly important but we're also not a harm reduction center and there's a place for that and that's not what we're going to be doing we're trying to keep people alive and that really was the purpose of the warming center it's to keep people alive when it is bitterly cold that weekend when the temperatures dropped we probably had about five men and women brought to the Army with frostbite that we treated. We've been able to medically detox four men who were undocumented, who cannot get a bed in a detox because of their undocumented status. Our doctor, Dr. Benjani, medically detoxed them at the Armory. We had We have a woman there who is, has a pervasive, me, pervasive mental illness, and we have not been able to get her into treatment anywhere because she won't sign the forms because she has pervasive mental illness. We have been treating her at the Armory. Our staff, Mo and Adrian, have gotten her after weeks and weeks and weeks of getting her out from underneath a blanket to agree to let us try to get her a bed in a group home. This is the humanity part of what we're doing at the Armory. And I really want you to recognize that this is really, the thing that the Armory has done, and we have folks here from other agencies who have done this work for a long time, House of Hope has done incredible street outreach work. It has brought the, to one place the ways that our systems have failed many of the folks who don't have a voice many of the men and women who have been unhoused for a long period of time we do not have shelter beds for everybody at the armory if we could put everybody at the armory in a bed right now we would but we don't have enough small shelters where people who have substance use disorders and behavioral health disorders where they can feel safe. 
Many of the folks who have come to Armory have been sleeping outside for a long period of time because they did not feel safe in places like bigger shelters. So they chose to sleep outside. We're now working on trying to get them someplace. But I would be lying to you if I said that we're going to have a bed for every person that's been there by April 30th. It's not going to happen. I know that Secretary Pryor will give you an overview of things that are in the works. But in fairness to him and Hannah, they just started January 6th. Or February 6th? February 6th. We were on the phone January 6th. We were meeting January 6th, but they hadn't started yet. The other thing I will say is that we have we never have been able to do this without the armory. David has been a partner in this every step of the way. I believe we've taught them a lot about how to work with people in a loving, caring way. We even have an ongoing joke that we're teaching the guards how to hug. Yeah. <laughs> LT just walked in the door. He's the <laughs> LT has been there day and night with us. So we have learned from each other. They have helped us set up structures so that we can keep people safe inside the armory. I know people have complained about the porta johns. Believe me, if we didn't have to use porta johns, we would not be using porta johns. We have company cleaning the porta johns twice a day. We have five cleaners from Amos House's staff that we've hired to clean the grounds. We have a contract for the park. Our staff hand up program has been cleaning up around. It's probably not enough. I'm sure you're probably still having folks come by your doorstep and do things that you don't want them to do, and I apologize for that. All I'm asking as the director of Amos House is to let us work to get folks to the best place they can be as quickly as we can. That doesn't mean I'm asking for us to stay through the summer. I don't think that would be a good idea. And I've said that to the state, I've said that to the guard, but we might need a little bit more time. I know our contract was supposed to be up April 15th. We may be there through the end of April. Hopefully that's it. But I invite you to come in as much as you want. Can I get a show of hands of how many people have actually come inside and met the folks? Look at that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. So I'm going to stop now. I'm going to turn it over to Secretary. Well, actually, That's fine. you can. <laughs> and I, I, I cannot say enough how grateful we are that you all did allow us to come into the community. I've been doing this work in Amos House for many, many, many years, and I appreciate the support that we've gotten. And I agree with you that this is not the solution. And I will give you my word that we are not staying at the armory. Absolutely not. Thank you. Thank you so much. The second guest we'd like to bring up is Secretary Pryor. It's very good to be with you this evening. Thank you so much. Um, I think you just heard a very you just heard a very small portion of what Amos House has been doing. Um, I just want to start by saying what Eileen Hayes and the team at Amos House is doing is miraculous. It is way beyond what Amos House signed up for. It is well beyond their original their original operations capacity. Eileen is astounding. She's an angel. Do we appreciate her? And I want to say with equal heartfelt enthusiasm, thank you to this community. The West End has opened its arms under very difficult circumstances to folks who have no place else to go. You did so in a way that was, I think, exemplary. Um, and you have, in some cases, had to withstand some challenges that have arisen. 
Thank you. It really has been beautiful to see. It has not been easy. It continues to be challenging. Um, it is the spirit of Ebenezer Dexter, those who walk through the park, many in this room walk the park a lot, you see on the statue to Mr. Dexter the statement that the park was donated both for the purpose of the people in the community and for the homeless. And for the homeless. On the inscription of the pedestal of that statue, that's that's the continuing spirit of this community. It is breathtaking, it is beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, please give yourselves a round of applause. We are so grateful to you, and we do not take it for granted. Armory is a state asset. It's state property, it serves the entire state. Every piece of state property exists in a place. This is a special place, and we really do appreciate it. Now, uh, I wanna to talk to you about what we're trying to do in order to ensure that we can fulfill what Eileen just said. Eileen said it beautifully, perfectly. We do not intend for the armory to serve on a long-term basis as a homelessness-related facility. We do not. We share in your enthusiasm for, over the long-term, a reuse of the armory. That's not the subject of tonight. I'm the housing guy. I'm gonna to talk to you about what we're doing around housing and shelter and services for our brothers and sisters who are homeless. But I want to say to you that we know that the Armory has another future that we all need to pursue. So what I want to explain, explain to you is how we are working our hearts out in the state with a partnership with City of Providence to achieve the goal of ramping down in April, the end of April, in April, and we hope and believe we can get there. We need to do this responsibly because the spirit of this neighborhood remains. The West End is about this kind of civic contribution and spirit of selflessness, and we want to ensure that we transition with humanity the way you all want, the way you all are, are expressing to us, and that's what we're trying to do. So what I'm gonna do is walk you through what we are doing. Um, I wanna say a few other things. Council President Rachel Miller has been a terrific advocate and a great partner already, and she's working with the council staff and with the mayoral administration. We may have one of the finest mayors in our city's history in Brett Smiley. Um, he's early in his tenure, but the promise is there, and Courtney Hawkins is an outstanding COO, and we're working closely in partnership with them. Your, le your legislative delegation is second to none. Senator Bell, Representative Sanchez, have been uh, authentic, vigorous, and constructive partners in their advocacy. Uh, and we're, we're very thankful for that. So what I'm describing is in the context of all of that support. We in the housing department, this very small emerging department, we're not doing this alone. Um, so what, what have we started to do already? That's what this page is. I know not everyone can see it, so I'm gonna say it out loud. Again, the purpose of this is to tell you, here's what we're doing to, to ramp down, to turn the armory back to you, back to Director Jim Thorson and the Department of Administration so, so that we can pursue, over the long term, a reuse. We've already funded new warming centers in other parts of the state, recognizing that although there is a high concentration of homelessness in Providence, the other parts of the state that also are host to individuals experiencing homelessness have a responsibility too. So we've worked with Pawtucket to open a new warming center, in, in my month or plus, month or so tenure with Hannah Moore and our whole team, we've opened a warming center in Pawtucket, the city taking the lead in Newport, the city and a key agency taking the lead. Uh, we've identified dozens of possible locations for possible shelters as well as uh, centers that are air conditioned in, into the warmer months in various forms where beds can be placed 
or where beds already exist, uh, and we're screening those. Um, as recently as today, we've taken some actions. Today, we formalized, we've been branching out and talking to these dozens of different locations, property owners, built structures, vacant land. By the way, Senator Bell and Representative Sanchez have even suggested locations. Council President Miller and her key staff have suggested ideas. We're all working together. Um, we put out a letter of a request for letters of intent. What does that mean? We put out a call for places that we've been talking to and places that we haven't to submit their properties so that we can evaluate them and we can see whether we can open up other locations so we can responsibly enable individuals who are experiencing homelessness and are currently housed at the armory to choose other locations. Um, we also put out something called a um, we put out something uh, called a request for expressions of interest to um, for those who are following our process that's through Rhode Island Housing's continuum of care. Two different calls for these purposes today. Um, we have additional beds that are already scheduled to come online beyond Pawtucket and Newport and other locations that are already open in addition to our ordinary set for, fo for folks who are homeless. Um, we have new beds that are slated to open. An example is right here in Providence at Emanuel House, House. There's a new level where new beds will be opening right here in Providence. It's a smaller structured environment, like Eileen was referring to, which is more conducive to living and is a more responsible, um, a better place for individuals who are experiencing homelessness. How about with families? We're, uh, we, uh, we just opened up a new facility. I'm glad you mentioned that, sir. Yeah, no, thank you for raising that. On Hartford Avenue here in Providence, right at the start of my tenure, we opened a new facility for families who are experiencing homelessness. And we're working on new locations. Couples who are experiencing homelessness. Couples. Pre uh, there's a, uh, with thanks to our colleagues from the Department of Administration and the Housing Department, we are next week, I'm just sharing with you what's actually happening. Is this really happening? Are we really exiting the armory? Yes. We're asking what's called the State Properties Commission, which is necessary to authorize new facilities to get this stuff done. We're getting a pre-authorization on Monday for the work that I'm describing to you. So we're being proactive to over, over this next month or so, month and a half, get the job done. And we're talking with vendors like Amos House, not at all exclusively Amos House, bless them. We're talking with vendors um, about various ways of remedying the problem of partnering to serve folks who are experiencing homelessness, including temporary structures. We've heard from some of the representatives in this room, state delegation, city representatives, that we like the idea in Providence of trying temporary structures that may be more accessible to folks who are currently homelessness and might have a door with a lock and not be congregate, not be the big open spaces that we have, for example, at the Armory. We are really deep in the process of looking at different products and possibilities that are temporary structures like pallet housing, tiny homes, and other very temporary structures that would be air conditioned in the warmer months, and if necessary, moving into the colder months. So there's a lot of work going on. This is only a piece of it. I know it's a geeky version. It's a lot of detail. What we wanted to share with you, because you've earned it as a community through your hospitality, is that we mean it when we say we are working our hearts out to be complete with our mission at the Armory by the end of April. We hope and we believe we can get there. We aim to do this responsibly. So those are our best efforts to get there. Next. So um, the big message here is that um, we are fanning out across the state. We are contacting everyone we know, landlord, owner, service provider. We are getting the job done, but we do need help. So quite frankly, uh, I know for some in the room, this isn't as easy. If you know of a property, you're thinking, well, what about XYZ property? Please reach out to us. One of the requests, by the way, was for some phone numbers. There are now two publicly available phone numbers that 
the council president's office possesses and is welcome to put out. I'm not sure if it's out already, but there's a phone number that Eileen, to her credit, wants uh, to be the main number if you have questions about the current residents, the individual clients, the individuals who are experiencing homelessness, or about the operations. Amos House has a phone number for you, and there's also a housing department phone number. If you have ideas, have you thought about this facility? What about this solution? We're looking for that. Now, we are far along, but we're looking for that. I also want to let you know that uh, doc, uh, that uh, Director James Thorson, um, my great colleague and friend Jim at the Department of Administration is also working intensively hard on all of this, as well as on the future reuse of the armory. He's here. Um, those efforts really are underway. That's for real as well. So that's what we wanted to share with you today. Um, I want to end where I began. Thank you. We know it hasn't been easy, but you have perpetuated the spirit of Mr. Dexter, and you have shown hospitality that, honestly, not every community would. We appreciate it. Please continue to partner with us through the end of April and help us do this job responsibly for our most vulnerable Rhode Islanders on their behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just real quick, we have uh, two more guest speakers, but I really want us to hold our comments or our questions to the end. That'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. I'd like to bring up Senator Sam Bell. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, for coming out. And thank you to Secretary Pryor for being here. It is really appreciated. I'm not going to talk forever because I want this to be an opportunity for people to have questions. I know you have questions. For me, a couple of things are really important. Number one, we need to get to work yesterday on a plan to house as many people as humanely as possible in a transition plan that works, that is clearly penciled out, it's not an easy thing to do. We're running out of time, and we have to get to work to meet these deadlines. If we just wait, instead we send a bunch of members of law enforcement and take people out onto the street, that's not the command approach. We have to get to work as soon as possible. It's not easy work, that has to begin as soon as we can. Second thing is, I think we also have to remember the importance of getting the scout project funded to begin with funding in this budget year, we can make it happen. Because this is an important vision. We fought so hard for so many years, so many people in this room have fought so hard to see that vision move forward, and we don't want to see it derailed. So again, thank you all, and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions, and I think we'll have a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to bring up Representative Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, everyone. My name is Enrique Sanchez, new state uh, representative here in the House District 9. I'm going to keep this short as well so we can have time for questions and answers. Um, we are facing uh, a houseless uh, homelessness crisis, housing crisis, um, and we're trying to find uh, effective long-term and short-term solutions to address this houseless crisis. And while you know we, we were supporting the efforts being made at the temporary shelter, at the Cranston Armory, we do understand the concerns and the, and the, the, the concerns, the problems, the issues that, that have risen up in the community. And that's what we're here to address and to uh, develop a plan for, a plan of action for. But there are also hundreds of people living in the streets all across the city and other parts of the, the of Providence, and I also understand that we have to address those homelessness situations, uh, concerns, and other parts that are have been devastating the South Side, other parts of Silver Lake, uh, Hartford, uh, the North at the North End, and you know those folks, their voices also have to be taken into consideration. But we're here to build a plan that is going to be uh, a consensus building one and uh, affecting in a positive way all communities across the city. Thank you. Thank you. So um, this next part, will we do with the answers, uh, question and answers? Um, yes. 
Um, there's this perception out there that somehow this is hold, a up. hold on one second. It's going to be over here. So <laughs> let, me, let me explain real quick. So we got 40 minutes. We have 40 minutes. So let's make sure that we give everybody a chance to be able to talk and be able to get their questions out. We greatly appreciate it. I don't want this to be a debate. It's just a question. We want to ask some questions. It can't be. A, we don't want to be debating. We understand how serious this is, and we understand how the, the residents are concerned, but I want to make sure that we get as many questions as we can in this next 40 minutes, okay? So we're going to stop. We will have the question. You can walk over there and ask your questions, and then we can start from there. So he has his first question. Um, if I could That's fine. Go ahead. say it out loud. Uh, two quick questions. Number one, we're going to be replacing warming centers in just a short two months or so with cooling centers. And I was wondering if that's been taken into consideration, given the type of summer that we might have here in Providence during global warming. Number two, it was clearly the policy, and it was enumerated by the city of Woonsocket, that their response to homelessness was to put people in cars and drive them to the armory. That was actually said in public, and I've got it recorded. So what was the state's reaction to that, and how is that prevented so that cities like Woonsocket are accountable to their own community? Uh, two responses. Thank you for the question. Uh, first, on the issue of ensuring that whatever we are standing up, a new facility, a temporary structure, that it is air conditioned in response to the warmer months, uh, that's exactly what we're doing, is we are aiming for that. Um, so we're looking at HVAC units, whether they either are already in the structure or can be, that's exactly what we're doing. On um, the issue of Woonsocket, uh, I'm not familiar with those exact comments, but I will say that uh, we are in direct touch with agencies that serve Woonsocket and the surrounding area. Uh, we on the housing department in my tenure have visited Woonsocket repeatedly and have um, ha have a dialogue going actively around, around sh serving individuals who, who are experiencing homelessness in Woonsocket. Thank you. Next question. It's working. Okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, for this opportunity tonight. My name is Doug Victor, and I live in the south side of Providence. Yeah. So, um, um, boy, my question is: in this in this process, in the short term and the long term, will the story of the south side, in terms of the impact of of the concentration of homelessness in the south side, that has had on the on, on the livability of the neighborhood and the economics of the neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. My, my larger question is, will this be shared equitably? Will the responsibility for people who are unhoused be shared equitably with all the neighborhoods across the city and all the cities and towns across the state? Because the south side, it's not, it's concentrating folks in the south side and continuing to concentrate folks in the south side who are unhoused is not the solution. It's not the solution for those folks and it's not the solution for the south side of Providence. So thank you very much. Thank you for that question. Very eloquent. And I think I speak on behalf of everyone in the housing department when I say we very much embrace that perspective of the fact that this work has to be conducted in an equitable way. We need to ensure that the responsibility is shared across our state. I think I've started to demonstrate that with what we illustrated in our presentation today. Pawtucket did not have, Pawtucket did not have a shelter or warming center until our arrival. Now, the city took terrific efforts under Mayor Grebe, but uh, we just started the first warming center in memory, you know, in, but when we arrived, nothing existed. Newport started up a new center. We're in discussions around other locations across this city, and there is a significant challenge regarding homelessness in this city, our capital city, and across the state. So that is very much the way we aim to go about it, but I, I'm glad to introduce the the concept of, a, of the solution. What, what is the solution? 
How do we do this equitably? And I want to say another thing. The long-term solution isn't a congregate shelter, a, a big open space with, with a lot of cots. That's not a solution. That's not providing folks with a truly better future en route to gainful employment and a uh, roof over one's head that you can count on. It's not. So we need to build permanent and supportive housing for our most vulnerable Rhode Islanders. That's our mission. What we are doing right now is building a bridge to the time where we have more housing units suitable for our most vulnerable residents. That's where we've got to get, and we need your support getting there. It's going to take continuous support from the General Assembly. By the way, that support is already very strong. We need the resources to do it. We need a couple years to start building it. That's how long it takes to design, get in the ground, build, cut ribbon, open it up. And we're going to need years more of commitment. And I'm glad that, that question triggered all of that. We've got to build proper, supportive housing for our most vulnerable residents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, Stephanie Beattie. Uh, my question is this. And so as we're talking about homelessness and housing those who are most vulnerable, we're also not talking about affordable housing and which would actually put those who are having rent issues to become one of those folks who become homeless, right? So how are we tackling that part, the affordable housing, so people who have rent can stay and afford to, afford to stay in their respective apartments or homes so they don't become homeless? And then for the folks who are homeless and are staying at the armory in different locations, what are we doing as a solution to make sure that they're coming out of that space so that they can actually live a more comfortable lifestyle, which is what they want, right? To be able to live a life in dignity and to be able to work. Right. First of all, thank you for your comments, Stephanie, and it's good to see you, and thank you for your continued advocacy across our state. Um, so, first of all, we are reinforcing each other, and I'm glad for this, because when I speak of permanent housing for individuals who are currently experiencing homelessness, that's affordable housing. That is what I'm talking about, is building permanent, available, accessible, affordable housing for folks and attaching services to it. That's the supportive part of permanent supportive housing. That's what we must do. That's got to be our mission. Shelter is necessary, but it's not the long-term solution. We will always need some, but we shouldn't exclusively be building a shelter system. We need to build affordable, high-quality housing for our residents, including our most vulnerable, including, our, including lowest-income residents. Um, how are we doing it is part of your question, and it's a good question, and to try to be brief about it, but to say it, a big part of what the very small housing department is doing is working with our fellow state agencies and municipal agencies across the state and we are looking to increase housing production. We are looking to increase the groundbreakings for and the conversion of buildings for housing with a special emphasis on affordable housing, meaning that the prices are accessible to our lower income Rhode Islanders. And we're doing that in several ways. We are allocating a quarter billion dollars of our American Rescue Plan allocation as a state to housing a big chunk of that for affordable housing, but that's not enough. We are dedicating a new, recurring, ongoing, permanent stream of revenue off of the sale of other properties across the state, the conveyance tax, and we're dedicating that to the production of affordable housing. And periodically, when we all go to the voting booth here in Rhode Island and we vote for the ballot initiatives, one of the spending initiatives a lot of the time is for affordable housing. It's a, it's a general obligation bond. We're doing that too. In addition, under the leadership of Speaker Shikarshi, the Speaker of the State House, of course, um, there's a package of reforms to help us get more housing approved at the local level through a more efficient, consistent, predictable process. Right now, it's scattershot, inconsistent, and unreliable. So all those things are happening, and we've got to do more, but that's just a starting point. And what I'm expressing to you is that's the work we all need to be focused upon because the real solutions, the long-term solutions, including for individuals experiencing homelessness, involves at least in part housing, affordable housing. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Keisha Dickey and Roman Dickey, and I work with lovely ladies in the back um, at Sincere Multi Service and Sincere Consulting Service. And my question is Did you ever think about using financial literacy programs, such as one that we run, to help the homeless secure that financial security, stability, generational wealth? Because if they're secure, once they have a safe place and a home and you know, everything that they need, that financial literacy is very important for economic development to make sure that they're secure and pass the information along to their children. So would you ever use a program like that or what are your plans? Yeah, very much. Um, it's actually, thank you for that question. The question for, I think everyone could hear it, it was about financial literacy and whether that's part of the solution. It can be uh, part of what we do, very, very much so. And just in terms of my personal background, a big chunk of my career was also in public education, and uh, I had, in my previous life, worked on helping financial literacy programs, among many things. But I was able to help some financial literacy programs get started. I very much believe in that, because if you don't have fluency in finance, it's very hard to create the assets in your life and to build a better future. So I really love, I'd love to talk with you on, on the side after we're done, and I absolutely think that housing is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the success of Rhode Islanders. We need housing, but especially for vulnerable Rhode Islanders, Rhode Islanders coming from behind economically, you need financial literacy, you need access to high quality jobs, you need training, you need a high quality educational system, you need services, so we need to work. And one of the things I wanted to say, uh, it wasn't in the slide presentation per se, but uh, under Governor McKee, we recently started an all of government response for housing and homelessness, meaning that our tiny housing department is happy to help coordinate, we're proud to spearhead some of these efforts, but we know that we need the Executive Office of Health and Human Services. We know we need our colleagues in commerce who are focused on finance. We know we need the Department of Administration, the National Guard, you get the idea. So we now have a structure and we have a way to respond and we're working on, for example, homelessness together. So thank you for the question. I'd love to do a sidebar with you. Good evening. My name is Bobby Almavero. Please allow me to quickly preface the foundation of what I'm about to ask. You might remember that when the homeless were at the State House and they had been asked to leave, a lawyer magically showed up, and they get to spend a couple extra weeks. I was the guy who recruited the lawyer. When the people, oh, thank you. When the folks left the state house to go to the warming center, a number of them switched drug dealers, and there were a number of overdoses in the first couple of weeks. And while there were no deaths at the Crisis Street Armory. There are some folks who didn't make it through January. Tonight, I've heard a lot about buildings. I've heard a lot about programs. And I can't tell you how weird it is to walk into the Francis Street Armory to 12-step someone, having known that 30 years ago I served there as a legal specialist for the first 103rd. But tonight I have not heard a lot about addiction. I have not heard a lot about mental illness. And we know... We know coming in that 65% of homeless folks are just like me. They've got a mental illness and addiction. I have 20 years now, so clean and sober. Okay. But for a lot of them, it's a lot of relapses and a lot of start overs and a lot of beginnings again. So I'm hoping to hear that tonight you'll commit to putting a focus knowing that you can build eight armories if we don't work on the addiction problem in this state, especially with Trank on the horizon, we're never going to catch up. So I'm hoping we can hear from you tonight a commitment to work on the addiction and mental illness issues using that comprehensive enforcement thing you just talked about. Thank you. Yes. Uh, very much so. By the way, I'm, I'm taking these questions. I want to acknowledge, Eileen, if you, if you want to address the issue of 
substance use and abuse, you're welcome up here and whatever uh, other colleagues, the same. But I'm happy to answer that question. First of all, yeah, you've heard, even before I'm answering the question, you've heard of our embrace of the issue of going beyond housing to serve our most vulnerable residents, to serve folks who have such needs. So this, this government-wide approach across, uh, under Governor McKee involves the Executive Office of Health and Human Services and our colleagues who work on behavioral health and substance abuse and work on the solutions for these problems because we know we can't do it alone here in housing. Um, and another piece of what you're hearing from me, whenever I describe housing, serving individuals experiencing homelessness, I'm speaking of permanent supportive housing. The supportive part of that is services, inclusive of the treatment for addiction that's essential for success in the services domain. And when you hear me speak of our process where we're seeking sites, physical spaces, I'm talking about the fact that we also need more Amos houses. There's really no substitute for Amos house, but uh, we need more agencies, vendors, who are doing this kind of work and connect our clients, these vulnerable Rhode Islanders, with services. Uh, I want to recognize also Laura Jaworski, who's here from House of Hope, and also does very, very important work for our state. And the team from House of Hope. We must do that. So, sir, thank you for the question. We, we are living the point that you are making, and thank you for continuing to make the point. Great. Thank you. That's my job on the line. There you go. Okay. I got you. I don't want to get you in trouble. Um, so my name is Gemini Rivera. I'm a South Providence resident. And I, I want to thank you and everyone here who helped organize this meeting um, to make sure that they hear what the residents of the West End really are interested in. I also have to share that it was really triggering and offensive to hear some of the things you were saying because as a South Providence resident who's only been here 2.5 years, but who has actually spoken a lot to the constituents in the neighborhood. Um, it's, it's alarming to hear you thank and applaud everyone here for welcoming everyone when you, when you can obviously drive around our neighborhood or even go up Broad Street and look at the conditions. We're throwing out words like humanity. We're throwing out equity. And how can you look at our area and think that the way it looks is equitable to how other parts of the city are receiving funding and allocation. And so, it's really hard to sit here and have you applaud the residents of the West End. Please don't jump me, but I really do need to say this. Um, and not consider South Providence and what we endure, not just for two months, all year long and to actually talk about Dexter Park and how they're honoring someone we don't even have a park the size of that magnitude there and so I really want you to consider the language you use consider the constituents here because there's an obvious divide and you use the words of detail and honoring I look forward and I'm sure I won't be the only one to seeing a similar PowerPoint of the details and the direction you're taking to clean up the neighborhood because while we're talking about housing homeless we have to consider the area that they're in and broad street no excuse absolutely not we need to do better the city needs to do better the state needs to do better you said Britt mayor smiley's wonderful the jury's still out on that we look forward to seeing what may come I appreciate those comments, and I just want to say that I hope what you are hearing from me, and I'm telling you what I am, what I am saying, is that we need a citywide response, and indeed a statewide response, where we offer supports and we offer investments to solve the problems we have and to remedy the major challenges that are before us. And it's not just in any one place. So thank you for that comment, and looking forward to the next question. Hi, my name is Linda Ibel. I'm also a Southside resident. Um, I'm very happy to hear the plans for um, transitional housing as well as long-term solutions. Um, as already has been said, a good majority of the people who are unhoused have um, severe mental illness, substance use issues. You need to address the mental health provider shortage in this state, and you need to make sure that there's access to substance use treatment. Um, 
uh, one other part of that question is what are you doing to prevent homelessness in terms of evictions and rental gouging by landlords? Yes. Thank you, John. Thank you. Especially take that last part. We're very focused on preventing homelessness because, of course, none of us wish to see homelessness occur in the first place. So there's a lot of aspects to that. Having adequate housing, available housing, is a big part of it. It's also about preventing evictions. And one of the things that my department is working on is a way of making investments in legal services for folks facing eviction so that they can overcome their legal challenges and stay where they are if that's what they wish. So we're doing a lot of work around this. That's just one example. More to come, and thanks for the question. Uh, hello, my name is Julio Barroa. I live literally right in front of the armory on the corner of Cranston Street and Dexter Street, so I've seen everything. Um, I have many questions. My first question is a yes or no, or I am putting that into consideration, uh, and that is uh, the tiny homes. Excuse me, one second. You can have one question. We have 25 minutes and it's a long line, okay. so please. Then I will reconsider my question then. Uh, so, um, there's a lot of talk about different types of housing. There's a lot of different, uh, are you listening or not? Okay. Um, have you talked about the different organizations around the city of Providence who are doing work in homelessness, like uh, Amos House, House of Kodak, House of Hope, and other organizations like, like such uh, with acquiring property. The city of Providence doesn't make it easy. Um, or how are you helping set organizations fulfill their missions? What support is being planned, if any? Um, with each of the organizations you named, we are either um, in discussions because their plans may be preliminary or we are already actively working together. Um, and um, what you saw me present today is that we just put out a call to organizations to come and provide services in the new places where we open up shop. So um, that's exactly what we're doing. And then we from the housing department will fund them to do that work. That doesn't mean that every organization automatically gets a contract, not at all. There needs to be a set of services provided. It has to be high quality. It has to fit the locations. But um, that's exactly what we're doing. So we're working with those very organizations, the ones you named, and many, many more. And we're frankly looking for new organizations to sign up. So over time, we're going to create a way for organizations that might want to get into this area of work and help our most vulnerable Rhode Islanders, help individuals experiencing homelessness. So stay tuned for that. How are you doing? My name is Adam Northrup. Um, I was a big part in with the ACLU and Matthewson Street Church. I'm getting the Cranston Street Armory open. Um, I just had one question. Well, let me say thank you first to Amos House uh, directly towards I mean, Mo and Doc. Um, it was not for Mo. I am one of those four that could not get a bed at a detox, and the doctor got me a bed the very next bed. Um, I am now. And, um, but I do have one question. You're talking about the armory. What about the people you put in the hotels? What are you doing with them? Um, some, some of the individuals in hotels are able to continue their stays. There are cases where a hotel may be, uh, you know, coming back to their original line of work um, for visitors to Rhode Island. So then we have to find new locations, but there are hotels that are either still active or we might be looking to new hotel properties even to, to provide services for folks who are experiencing homelessness. So good question. Hotels are an important question and part of the mix. If I have to explain to another person. <laughs> so um, I just want to speak about our language the language that we use. Um, we need to stop with affordable housing because who is it affordable for? Um, AMI is different in different spectrums, brackets, if they carry TSA, I mean, you know, there's like 80 different million boxes that fit into there. So please, I beg, everybody in this room, if you care about low-income people, stop talking about affordable housing. We need low-income housing. 
besides just that, as somebody who was homeless, who utilized Avis Health Services years ago, my biggest concern in this room tonight is I don't see any representation other than the one individual that just left before me that I called to make sure he was here. Where, where are they? Why was there no efforts for them to be brought here? Their voice matters. And until we actually value people with lived experience, please don't tell me you value the people that you're working with. Um, I'm really glad you just said that. Uh, hi, my name is Betha Wood. I own Salon Bianco on Atmel's Avenue. I have for the last 15 years. And I am one of the founders of PVD House. We seek to build and sustain low-income housing and affordable small business space whose rents will support emergency, or as we like to call it, next step housing. Um, and, and we're going to implement co coaching programs to get people where they need to be for the long term. This is long-term sustainable living that pays for itself. My question for you is, how's the state going to help me get the mill uh, that I want that's owned by an out-of-state developer that is clearly a blighted property? with that property or its cost or what you want to do there, you sound like you have a lot to offer. So thank you for that. So maybe you can stay afterwards and talk to a member of my, my team. We welcome it. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Etienne Cote. You can call me if it's easier. Um, so I, I'm also a South Providence resident for many years next to Crossroads. So I'd like to see a commitment to uh, not concentrating poverty and social services there, especially when a lot of the actual residents aren't taking advantage of those services. You're you know, taking people from other areas, and that's shown in the demographics. But you mentioned permanent supportive housing. That's also, it sounds good, but you also, there's no oversight for permanent supportive housing or shelters. I was at the Rhode Island's continuum of care meeting the other day. There's no independent um, bodies to evaluate the, the, those services and make sure they're, they're healthy and safe for people. If they're not safe for the residents, it's not going to be safe for the neighbor. For example, Crossroads Rhode Island is given rubber stamp continuously because they're allowed to expand. In the past year, they've had 550 ambulance calls, a number of overdoses, and this is permanent supportive housing, not just uh, shelters, 116 Broad Street, it's still permanent supportive housing, which sounds great, but if you just give them a rubber stamp and you don't, you know, separate the folks in a uh, humane way, because if you speak to the people there, they'll tell you, you know, whether someone has drug issues or uh, mental health issues or, or just financial issues, everyone's just kind of thrown in there, concentrated there because other areas aren't, you know, doing their part, and it becomes a mess. you got classical there, and again, the highest percentage of black and brown people are in South Providence, and, and this happens to be in the same areas where the state has, cho has chosen to put all the shelters and all the other uh, social services. What does that do to the next generation of black and brown leaders at Classical and those other places? That's something that needs to be handled now, and it needs to be handled before Crossroads receives approval for their permanent supportive housing, because it's, it's, it's unsafe at the moment, and it, it, needs, it needs to be some in independent oversight before that's allowed to uh, seek approval. They have not received approval yet, they'll tell you that, but they have not. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Josh Sellers. I've been in the neighborhood for about 10 years, and um, I've watched it turn into uh, college campus. Um, it's, it's a lot of college students uh, just kind of rotating out, a lot of families getting pushed out. Um, we offer tax breaks to the colleges and they're building dorms for kids. I see a lot of micro lofts going up, $2,500 a month for micro lofts. Shouldn't those tax breaks come with support to the communities and uh, specifically uh, public schools? We got kids we gotta look out for. So we have some of the best colleges in the country in our state and we have some of the poorest conditions for uh, kids coming to school. So public schools, I think those tax breaks should come with um, community support. So. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rose. Uh, I spent a few years in my mid-40s couch surfing, so I guess I didn't really technically count as homeless because I did have a roof, but it was changing frequently. And I find myself in a different position. I was able to make some money and buy a house and provide stability for myself. Uh, and there are two things I want to say. One, 
I've spoken with my senator, Sam Bell, at length, and he has made it very clear that there are federal monies to the tune of $174 million a year available to this state to build low-income housing. And Massachusetts and Connecticut use every penny of their $174 million every year, and Rhode Island does not. So that is a significant problem. The second thing I would like to say is that as someone who has <laughs> the second thing I want to say is that part of the problem that one woman mentioned about landlords and raising rents is property taxes. I have uh, two houses on one lot. It qualifies as a six family. It gets taxed as a commercial property. These are small units, a four room, two bedroom apartment in each of those units. The taxes in 2019 were $9,000 a year. Three years later, in 2022, the taxes are over $28,000 a year. Every single one of the tenants pays $400 a month towards property taxes alone, not counting mortgages, not counting insurance or water and sewer bills. So the reason that half of the places in Providence have gone up astronomically is because property taxes have gone up astronomically. And from what I'm aware, at the state level, there is new legislation pending for nonprofits to have the right of first refusal to buy any six family or greater residential housing that goes on the market and take even more properties off the tax rolls so that then the few little mom and pop landlords left standing are literally taxed into bankruptcy. What are you doing about that? Two, two points uh, on the question of the legislation. Uh, I'm not familiar with it, so we will take a look at it. I'm on the job a little over a month. I haven't seen that legislation. If there's a city of Providence official who wants to speak to property taxes and the specific questions involved, feel free. Not requiring you to, but if you wish to, please let me know. On the issue of Senator Bell's contribution, and it's a, it's a good bit of work uh, that the Senator's done on, uh, I believe what you're referring to is the work he's done on the low-income housing tax credits, namely the 4% bucket. And Senator Bell uh, has brought some scholarly analysis to that. and. He's right that we are not fully tapping that program. Uh, now, we're not the only state in that category, but we should be one of the states that leads the way out of that category. And one of the key things that my team and I have started to examine is whether we can create a new tool that would help us leverage these 4% low-income housing tax credits. You don't have to understand that tax credit program to know it's one of the workhorses that across the country does help to drive the development of affordable housing, truly affordable for low-income individuals' housing. Um, so what I'd like to see us consider is how other states have built tools that are companions for the 4% tax credit and enable us to fill out the budget for a development, draw upon the 4% tax credit, add a dose of state resources, and get a project done. So my team is working very hard at examining different alternatives related to that. And I'm glad that you raised that question and I'm grateful for the work of Senator Bell. <laughs> I was holding well up for that applause. Um, I have a question that piggybacks on that and also um, talks about landlords. Um, I appreciate the idea that there would be financial or legal services provided to people facing a, a eviction, but most, many people that face eviction are already vulnerable. These are people who are working long hours, potentially more than one job. By the time they're needing legal services, it's too late. There is, there is a, like a wild west way that landlords are allowed to charge rents in Rhode Island. Full disclosure, I am a property owner. I own a multifamily, like I have tenants that pay rent. And I could, I could just increase their rent right, them right out of their, their lease. It's like not a real document. It's unconscionable. And is there any efforts along with this? Because of course, like these are the efforts that result in having to deal with transitional housing and all of this. So 
Are there, I know that there, I heard that there was talk about this. Is there a way to rein this in, to put a cap on how much rent can be increased annually? Um, to also to, is there, you know, we're, we're always like providing services to the people who need them, but are we ever going to provide educational services to the people who are in the system? Like, is there a plan to educate landlords on how to set your rents, how to make sure that you are setting your rents, not for the market value, but for like who can live in your neighborhood? What does your rent mean for like who earns that wage? And then what does your neighborhood look like collectively? So that's my question. Thank you. I think that you were right to describe the problem as involving rents that are not reachable by our residents. So we need to keep working at that. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. One of the ways is to invest in housing for low-income individuals, affordable housing, that brings the price points down, whether for rent or even for sale. Um, another way is to help to regulate the market. There are bills in the legislative session right now regarding that. Um, now, one of them, this is a small piece, but a very important piece, uh, has been endorsed by Speaker Shikarshi, uh, which gives it an even greater chance of success in the General Assembly, and that involves the fact that you have these filing fees or application fees that are increased, that keep increasing, and for individuals experiencing homelessness, where you may not have a spare dollar, an application fee means you, you can't even get in the door, you can't even start the process, even if you might have access to a voucher or access to a subsidy. It's incredibly limiting, so abolishing that is the proposal. That's one. And there are other proposals around notice for rent increases. So at least you can find a new place and you're not going off a cliff. So there's a variety of proposals out there. It does start with building more affordable housing. I have to keep emphasizing that. We must, in this state, commit ourselves to building more affordable housing. Uh, can I, uh, please, please. Oh, hold on, 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 She's the only person I guess to do that. <laughs> um, that's a good segue. So, you know, uh, there's been a lot of topics covered tonight, um, and we've heard a lot of response um, from Secretary Pryor, but I'm just hoping that before the end of the night, you know, as someone who is representing a lot of the population that's talked about not being a part of this conversation, that either you or I know there are some other people in the room who represent these populations, would just have an opportunity to kind of reflect on some of the things that were heard tonight and, you know, just give your, your debrief on what you've heard and what you think in your responses to some of this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. Oh, all the way down. <laughs> um, my name is Elizabeth. I am a realtor and I am also a single parent. I live in Onlyville. Um, I'm here because I hear you speaking of the low income and building affordable housing. And I will tell you that as a realtor, I see lots available that are being bought by investors and outside investors coming into our city and our state and they're buying up the affordable housing and they're, they're um, building and a lot of them with these flips are building, are, are, are flipping that I wouldn't allow my family to live in. Okay? And they're flipping and they're not making it affordable. They're raising rent for the people who get eviction notices. Do you know how many people reach out to me and say, Elizabeth, I'm looking for a, rent, a rental because my landlord is evicting me or they're raising rent or they're selling. And so the new landlord is gonna raise the rent on them. How many people I speak to that I cannot help? Do you know how heartbreaking it is to see a family with children that I cannot help? I'm like, what can you afford? Twelve hundred. What can you afford? Fifteen hundred. And you got Paragon Mills with one and two bedrooms for nineteen hundred. How is that okay? 
I would really like for us to really focus on not just affordable housing, but if we have lots available, we can, with all this money that you're talking about, we have 174 million, why can't we buy up those lots and build for these families if we really care, if we're really about humanity? Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is, uh, just so you know, we're going to um, end the question and answers. I'm going to bring up. Are you going to um, end it? Yeah, we're going to end it right now. We have to end it. We have a time frame, like I said. Nah, 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 nah. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I hear you, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. But you got to relax, though. I hear you, but you got to relax. Okay? Now, I'm going to hear what you got to say, but you have to relax. Okay, go ahead, let's, we're going to hear what you have to say. All right, thank you. My name is John Prince. A lot of you all already know me. Community activist in Providence. And all this talk, I hear, I haven't heard anything about the criminal justice system that these men and women come out of prison. Where are they going to live? Where are they going to live? And my thing is, it's like, I remember when I was homeless, when I got out of Max, living at Traveler's Aid. I don't know if y'all remember that. Eating stale donuts. Nowhere to go. My, my spirit was amputated. How do you man an uh, amputated spirit? There's no anesthetic for that. There's no anesthetic. And it hurts me to, to hear this affordable housing uh, it's almost sound like I'm at, I'm at uh, Lawrence Welch or so doing the Lawrence Welch dance and that old ass shit. <laughs> this is 2023, and we're still dancing around this issue. It's it's it's, it's humane. It's it's crazy. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right, we're gonna end the question and answers. And thank you, thank you for everybody with your question and answers. I'd like to uh, bring up. Councilman Rachel Miller, she wants to end with, a, with her last uh, um. Thank you so much, Director. And thank you, John. Uh, where'd John go? There she is. Thank you, John, for uh, <laughs> ending the questions tonight. Um, I want to take a moment to thank Secretary Pryor so much for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, and really thank all of you for being here and uh, being part of this question and answer. Before we close completely, I have a couple things I want to say before I do that. I would like to um, invite Director Thornton to join us just for, for a quick minute, introduce yourself. Uh, I want to thank you so much for coming. Uh, Director Thornton is the Director of the Department of Administration, um, which is part of you know the, the state apparatus that oversees the Armory. So uh, thank you so much. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, how many people here can remember when track meets were run at the Armory? There you go. There you go. My brother, not me. I played play basketball. But he ran in the armory, and that's a long time ago. And the building has been mostly empty since then, with occasional uses of military, community. But certainly, it's an underutilized property, and it wasn't designed to house the homeless. So, uh, looking to the future, uh, when I first started in DOA, uh, Carol Cornelison, who was at the time the head of the Division of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance. That's the property manager of the state. Rest in power, Carol. Yeah. She was awesome. But she told me when I first got there that one of, it was her mission to see what could be done to redevelop the armory and put it to higher use and restore it to at least some semblance of its former glory. And so after her passing, um, I took up the mantle and to see if there was something we could do with that. And you know, the community knows, not just this yeah. community, but other communities know, that we've been looking at a proposal by Scout, a firm that we engaged to be our uh, development plan. Yeah. Now, um, in December, I think Scout came and presented to you uh, an exciting plan. I think it's an exciting plan. So far, um, we, you know, we just saw that at the end of the year, which was late to get it into our budget process. So what we've been doing is that we've been working with Scout and talking to them about what this deal looks like. And we're in a very delicate stage right now of doing due diligence. In fact, last Friday, I was in Philadelphia looking at the other Scout facility that they developed 
from an old high school that dates back to the 30s. It's a beautiful facility and uh, very encouraging. Uh, just today, we, uh, we engaged a financial advisor to help us parse through the capital stack and see if we can make this deal work. Now, I want to be careful because the governor hasn't made any commitments. We haven't been given him enough information, and there's not a lot of questions I can answer right now because we're in the quiet period that every negotiation goes through when two parties are trying to come together and figure out how to get a deal done. But I am telling you one thing that is definite, and I'm not going to take any questions because we are still in the negotiating phase. Uh, we are going to be ready to talk about this publicly in May. So uh, I just wanted to tease you a little bit in that we're working. I'm working very hard. I um, was pretty skeptical as, until I saw the Bach facility in Philadelphia. Uh, I'd really love to make this work and make this a project make this a beautiful facility again, not just for your neighborhood association, but for the entire state. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank will you, you talk to us in May? We will talk to you in May. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Susan Hoffman, so again, I want to take a moment to uh, thank Secretary Pryor and his staff for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Director Stevens, for helping us have a, a positive conversation. Thank you. Um, Eileen for taking time out of the incredible work you do to spend with us and have a conversation. Um, there's, a, there's a few kind of leaving, leaving points I just want to share with you. So tonight the City Council uh, uh, reappointed our Housing Crisis Task Force. Um, that will be a center for the city to have a conversation with providers, to have a conversation with uh, community members who are struggling with this issue. Um, that'll be ongoing, um, and I'd like to also use that as an opportunity to give a shout. So the best way to reach me is at the council office at 521-7477. If you call during the day, it will be answered by one of the incredible council staff who helped make uh, tonight possible. I just want to give them a shout. Thank you so much for spending your night in our neighborhood. Um, but, but questions that you have um, relative to the conversation tonight, uh, Secretary Pryor's office did share with uh, me today a phone number for those two pieces, right, the kind of emergency what do I do phone number and also uh, a number about ongoing uh, conversations about housing. So anyone who signed in today will get that information um, as soon as we get it into a place where we can send it to you. Um, obviously this is an ongoing uh, crisis, an ongoing conversation that we're all very much lucky to have, uh, all of us committed to it on uh, the legislative side and also together with the WBNA. So I just want to thank everyone so much for being part of tonight. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do together, but thank you all. <laughs>